Good morning, church, and welcome to online worship here at Trinity United Methodist in Birmingham, Alabama. My name is Brian Erickson. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity. We're so grateful to have you joining us for worship this morning. Uh, as always, you can click like or share on our page and invite somebody else to join with you in worship if this is meaningful to you. And we hope you know that you are no less a part of our worshiping congregation just because you're watching online. Let's prepare our hearts and minds to meet the living Christ here in this hour of worship. All right, welcome to Contact. How are we doing this morning? Awesome. Let's get on our feet. Praise the Lord. starting with the 26th verse. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So we got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. 
He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and he asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom may I ask you? Does this prophet say this about himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak and starting with scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And when they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus and he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can have a seat. Well, good morning, friends. It is so good to see you here in worship. It's wonderful to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us online this morning. Thank you for spending this hour of your Sabbath with us. It is just delightful to be in worship with you. My name is Amy DeWitt. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity, and today we are finishing up that sermon series called Uncharted Waters. We've been talking all summer about scripture from, um, from the Bible that has the main character of water. And um, we're going to continue with that um, passage about the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch here in just a few minutes. Um, before that, I want to uh, mention a few announcements. Lots of things are kind of coming back online and relaunching around here. And um, there are many opportunities to serve. So I want to highlight just um, just one, and that is our tech team. As you can imagine, there are lots of people who um, make worship and other um, events and services happen around here um, that work behind the scenes. They are behind the cameras, literally. Um, they are pushing buttons. They are um, they <laughs> they're just amazing people who have been dedicated um, throughout this last year. And as we add more services and we're doing more things, we could use a lot more help. So I would invite you, if you were interested in that, um, to email Stuart Parker, that's sparker at trinitybirmingham.com, and he's coordinating all of those volunteers. He asked me to assure you that lots of these positions don't require a whole lot of training. They're really easy. They just take uh, humans to make things happen. So we would love your participation participation in that, um, even, even just once a month. Uh, if, if you want to just learn more about that, do email Stuart S. Parker at trinitybirmingham.com. We're also so thankful for the ways that you've been supporting ministry um, and making sure that we can continue to worship together and serve together and have awesome things like Vacation Bible School together. Um, thank you particularly for your financial support, which has just remained so strong over this, um, over, over the last year. Um, you can continue to give through our Trinity app or our website, trinitybirmingham.com, and just click on the Give button. There's also a box on your way out that says, uh, place your offering here. Uh, if you have a, a check or cash offering today, you can just drop in that box. That's easy as well. There are lots of things going on in the life of our church today. I wanna, want you to see this uh, quick video about things that are happening soon. Good morning, Good congregation. Good morning, congregation, and welcome to Trinity News. I'm your host, Emily Wilson, informing you on all the latest and greatest in Hey Neighbor happenings. Save the date, August 6th, is Element Student Ministries annual golf tournament. This is our biggest fundraiser to help provide scholarships for students to participate in any of our ministries, events, or retreats. 
you can sign up as an individual or as a team of four. Check it out at elementstudentministry.com. High School Discovery is coming up August 14th through the 15th. If you are a rising 9th through 12th grader, we want you there. You can sign up for High School Discovery at highschooldiscovery.com. Lastly, it's that time of year again. The Little Lambs Consignment Sale is happening August 26th through the 28th. This is a awesome opportunity for you to buy lightly used children's clothes and whatever we don't sell, we donate to awesome organizations around our community. You can learn more about Little Lambs on Trinity's website. Now hear about more ways that you can get involved here at Trinity. Hi Trinity, I'm Mary Liz Ingram, the Outreach Coordinator. Each Thursday, neighbors come together at the sharing table at Trinity West Homewood, where families can get what they need in a welcoming, relational environment. We need a few volunteers to help us wrap up this ministry each week from three to four, consolidating donations and resetting the gym. If you have an hour to spare any Thursday, you are welcome to join us. Also, if you'd like to show our neighbors some love by providing sack lunches for those arriving early, you can find the sign up on our website. To meet the needs of our neighbors even more, we will begin offering community English classes on Monday nights starting in September. We're looking for volunteers to provide childcare for young kids and homework help or tutoring for school age students. This will be a great way to connect and enable adults to attend classes. If you're interested in serving in this new ministry, contact me anytime. For more information on these programs and our other ministries, check out our website. As always, thanks for serving your neighbors. Well, congregation, that's all I have for you. Be sure to check back next week for the latest and greatest in Hey Neighbor happenings. I'm your host, Emily Wilson, and you've been watching Trinity News. Morning, friends. All right, if we have any young friends, will you please stand and bear with me because a dragon lost her voice last week. So if you are one of my young friends, stand up. Now, you've heard me talk a lot about my grandma over the years. I've, I've talked a lot about my grandma because she was a pretty awesome woman. But I don't know if I've shared before that she had a, a super gift, kind of like a superpower. So can you all put on your superhero goggles? My grandma Betty had this cool way of putting on these imaginary goggles and she could see people who might be lonely. And she could see people who didn't have a place to like, eat their Thanksgiving meal. And she could see people who were spending Christmas alone. And Grandma Betty would invite them to her table every year. There were always random people at our holiday meals. And she just kept adding more and more people. And as a kid, it felt very normal to have people that we didn't know sitting around our table. But as an adult, I see that's kind of strange. Because typically for holiday family meals, you have people that are related to you. But Grandma Betty had a superpower. She could put on these super goggles and see who is lonely and see who is not with other people and see who is outcast and invite them in. Just like in our scripture lesson, we learned about Philip. He looked at the eunuch and he could put on those super goggles and see the same. Now, friends, I didn't tell our Trinity Kids intern I was going to do this, but we've had the pleasure all summer of spending the, the, all of our summer programming with someone who has these goggles. Her name is Miss Maggie. She's right in the back, right in the middle, and I'm calling her out, and she didn't know I was going to do this. So friends, I want you to thank Miss Maggie, because today is our last Sunday with Miss Maggie. She's going to spend Sumatanga week with us, but then she's going back to college. She has been one who has looked out for the outsiders and has looked out for all of our young friends and welcomed them in. And guys, guess what? You're gonna go back to school in a few weeks. So I want you to take these goggles with you to school, okay? Can everybody do that thumbs up? You're gonna take these super power goggles and I want you to look out for those who are lonely and invite them to your table. I want you to look out for those who are playing by themselves on the playground and invite them to show you how they do the monkey bars. Does that work guys? Because we can be the change makers even though we are young. Thumbs up, let's pray together. Dear God, we know that you call us to love all of those, even those who are lonely and sad, and especially those who are by themselves. Help us be the change makers. Amen.
as I said, this past week we hosted Vacation Bible School, which this year had a medieval castle theme. So you may still see some remnants of that castle downstairs, and there's probably some photographic evidence of some of your pastoral staff dressed up as knights, maybe a princess or two, certainly one very special dragon. Our kids learned about armoring up with truth and justice and peace and faith. And they remember details of Bible stories probably better than you and I do. They can pronounce Nebuchadnezzar and they can pronounce Abednego with the best of them. You should totally ask the youngest members of our congregation all the things they learned and experienced this past week. A few weeks ago, our older kids uh, got together for venture and they took an even deeper dive into this theme, learning about the nature of God's kingdom. Um, was there anybody here who was part of Venture this year? I see some of you. Can somebody tell me what kind of kingdom we talked about during Venture? Anybody? The upside down, the upside down kingdom. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. because That's kind of what I want to talk about today. We talked about God's upside down kingdom, that in Jesus... The conventional ways of the world get turned on their head. So I've had this theme song from Venture in my head for really like the last several weeks. And, and our own John Mark arranged the song so you know it's really good. And the chorus goes, Welcome to the upside down kingdom where servants sit on thrones, where the last shall be first and the greatest are unknowns. Now, depending on what season of your life you were in, that may sound like the best news ever, or it may sound like idealistic mumbo jumbo, or it may sound just ridiculous and wrongheaded. But the truth is this is just, this is just the way of Jesus. Can you hear the allusions to Jesus stories in those phrases? Welcome to the upside down kingdoms where servants sit on thrones. Jesus, who got on the floor to wash his disciples' feet, who turned himself into a literal servant on the night when he was facing his own turmoil, facing his own death. It's the same Jesus who ascended to the throne at the right hand of God, right, where servants sit on thrones. Jesus, who said explicitly as he was kind of buttoning up a parable about God expending more grace than is warranted or required, he said, the last will be first, and the first will be last. He said it explicitly. Welcome to the Upside Down Kingdom, where servants sit on thrones, where the last become the first, and the greatest are unknowns. Today, I want to highlight one of those great unknowns from Scripture. One of a multitude of instances where God turns expectations of the world upside down. It's a story about a man whose name we don't know. We only know him by his status in society. We call him the Ethiopian eunuch. But in the kingdom of God, he is so much more than that. And we find that out throughout this story. So here's how the story goes. Actually, I, I want to back up and talk about Philip for a second. Because this part is totally upside down too. You have to know about Philip. Philip was an early convert to Christianity. He must have been a real team player, one of those people that you can always count on to, to step up and do things because the disciples chose him to be one of seven volunteers whose job it was to make sure everybody in the community was cared for. He was one of these kinds of people that just looked out for outsiders and anybody who wasn't taken care of. So in the community, in the early nascent Christian community, there was some concern that widows were being left out of the ministry, that they weren't included when everybody was sharing food with each other, for example. And some people went to the apostles and they said, we've got to take care of these people. They were really complaining to the apostles, wanting the apostles to do something about it. But the apostles didn't want to take any effort or time away from their preaching and praying. So they commissioned these seven guys, Philip was one of them, to make sure everybody was seen, everybody was covered. They were servants. 
But this is what happened when persecution ramped up in Jerusalem. All the Christians, except for the apostles, were, were scattered out of the city. That didn't keep them from doing ministry. Ministry just looked different outside of the city. So these helpers, these people who were commissioned to just take care of people, they ended up out in the world. They ended up being the ones who preached and prayed out in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, just like Jesus had told the apostles to do from the beginning. Well, Philip went to Samaria first, and he preached good news there. He cast out demons, he healed the sick, lots of people were baptized by Philip. Lots of people became followers of Jesus because of Philip. So you take a look, talk about turning the world upside down. This is a whole different calling for this guy whose job it was to make sure church supper happened in Jerusalem. It wasn't a less important job, of course. It was just a totally different life trajectory. God had called him to something different. Okay, so one day he is doing this work in Samaria, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him and told him to leave Samaria and to travel down to this road, the road that goes between Jerusalem and Gaza. And this is where he meets this Ethiopian eunuch. So what do we know about this guy? Well, we know that he was a servant in the court of the Candace. The Candace is the, the queen of the Ethiopians. Now, we're not talking about the modern nation state of Ethiopia, of course. It sounds like Acts is referring to a distinct group, this queendom ruled by this monarch. But, but the word Ethiopia was also used in kind of a more general way. Ethiopian was also a word that was used to talk about darker skinned people, sometimes in a purely descriptive way, sometimes blatantly othering these folks they use the word Ethiopian about. In any case, Acts makes a point to mention that he wasn't from around there. This Ethiopian eunuch wasn't one of them. He was an outsider and a minority in this region. But he had also come from worshiping in Jerusalem, which leads me to believe that he was an observant Jew. And that tracks, there were certainly Jewish people in Ethiopia at the time. Well, what else do we know about him? Acts makes sure we know he was a eunuch. We don't know for sure what happened in his life to warrant that description. We don't know anything about his backstory, really. Many biblical scholars believe it was likely a condition of his position in the court of the Candace, the queen. He was most certainly thought of as a gender minority, not fitting into the norms of his culture and his day, not fully considered a man, not not a man. It marginalized him, absolutely. And then again, this meant that he got to be close to the queen. Maybe he was the queen's confidant, apparently a trusted member of the team. Okay, but, but to nuance things even more, he was a servant, right? This was a, a lowly position, we think. It connotes a, a lower status. We don't know if his role was compensated at all. It could have been compulsory, which is just a polite word for slave. Oh, okay, but then again, he was the, the keeper of the coin, which seems to me like an honored position. He could read, apparently, and he was in possession of this scripture scroll, which was not an easy get. So what I'm saying is the Ethiopian eunuch had a kind of complicated identity, right? He lived a series of contradictions. He was a Jew, probably, but certainly an outsider in Israel. He was on the fringes of society because of what people would have thought about his gender identity. But he was also a member of the queen's court. He had some influence, it seems, but he was most certainly a servant all at the same time. And he must have been keenly aware of all these personal identity dynamics, especially as he traveled far from home. You know how you know you're different when you go to a place where you, you're certainly the minority 
in the room. And I bet he was super aware of, after going to Jerusalem to work, worship, he was super aware of all these identity dynamics that he carried with him. Because you see, some of these identities would have, may have precluded him from worship in the temple, or at least kept him kind of on the fringes, on the outskirts. There were certain categories, certain categories of people who had been forbidden from entering the temple from way back, from long time ago. It takes, for example, foreigners. And this Ethiopian was certainly a foreigner. A few hundred years before the prophet Ezekiel proclaimed that no foreigner should enter the temple. And it was because the Israelites themselves had neglected worship. They weren't, they weren't going to the temple to worship. They'd abdicated their temple roles to outsiders. So forbidding foreigners from entering the temple was a way of getting the Israelites to step up and to do their duty. Okay, so also, also eunuchs explicitly barred from temple worship. Deuteronomy 23 specifically says that eunuchs should not be uh, admitted to the assembly of the Lord, presumably because they were considered ritually unclean. All right, so this is more than you asked or bargained for when you came to church this morning. But it's, it's, an, important, it's an important way to tell the story of why people exclude and marginalize other people. Can, so we can understand just how Jesus turns that inside down, inside out and upside down. Those are the phrases, right? It's important to know the history of how we've done this to each other. And in this case, in the ancient Israelite tradition, a key factor of what made something considered ritually clean or ritually unclean, whether an animal was worthy of sacrifice or not, whether something was fit to eat or not, whether someone could come into the presence of God or not ritually clean or ritually unclean, one of the things that made that distinction was whether or not they fit into neat categories. Okay, so here's an example. Shellfish, you know, are not ritually clean. To this day, crabs and lobsters and crawfish, or crawdads or crayfish or whatever you call them, those, those things from Louisiana, they are not considered ritually clean. They're not kosher still to this day. Why? Well, because they don't fit into neat ancient conceptions of animal classification. To the ancient Israelites, fish lived in the ocean and had fins. That's what made a fish. And animals lived on the land and walked on legs. That's what made an animal. Okay, but, but lobsters walk on legs and live in the ocean. So where do they fit? They don't fit. And that's part of what made something ritually unclean. So eunuchs also didn't fit. They didn't fit into neat gender categories. And so they weren't considered ritually clean. They weren't considered able to enter the temple. So this man who had traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship God was probably met with some pushback when he got there. Some questions, some side-eye, maybe outright exclusion. His trip to the Holy Land was not exactly what he had hoped for or imagined. And now he's on his way home and he takes some solace and some quiet time to read scripture, to read the word of his God and the story of his people. And that's when his chariot comes up along, alongside this Philip, this Philip who has goggles to see. He was on the road where God told him to go. Remember, Philip was in Samaria, and God swept him up and said, you're going to go to this road between Jerusalem and Gaza. That's where he found the Ethiopian eunuch. And maybe he was just making conversation, or maybe it was that he really had turned into an honest to evangelist. But Philip wouldn't let this be one of those situations where you just kind of pass somebody as if you didn't see them, as if you weren't in each other's presence, and you just go about your business is if you haven't seen each other. Philip's like, 
I'm going to engage with this guy. And so he says, hey, what are you reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch shows him this passage. They read it together, and it goes like this. It says, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb silent before his shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Sound like anybody you know? It was Isaiah 53. And the eunuch's like, who is this talking about? Which was the perfect opener for Philip to tell him about Jesus, the Savior who was humiliated, who was denied justice, who didn't fight his oppressors, whose life was taken from him, just like Isaiah said. And whatever Philip said must have been compelling. Jesus is compelling. So when they came up on a stream, this Ethiopian, this eunuch, says, why shouldn't I get baptized in the name of this Jesus right here, right now? Let's do this thing. So Philip, this caretaker turned preacher, baptized him right then and there. And I don't know if this feels empowering or audacious or what, but it says something to me that the, Ethio the Ethiopian eunuch didn't pause before he said, this baptism thing, this Jesus person, he's for me. I'm part of this family now. And it makes me wonder if the Ethiopian eunuch hadn't already read a little bit further in Isaiah, because just a few lines down in Isaiah 56, Isaiah proclaims that there will be a day when people like him are included in the household of God. Isaiah 56 says, Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the thing that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not proclaim, profane it, I hold fast my covenant. You are included. Nobody can tell you otherwise because I said so. These I will bring to my holy mountain. And I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. For all peoples. So it's no wonder this eunuch, this foreigner, would presume to be baptized in the name of Jesus because this Jesus was the one who came expressly to welcome and to include and to incorporate people just like him, people who had been excluded or marginalized, who had been cast away or left out on the fringes. This Jesus says, if you want to be a part of my way, then you belong to me. And my gut is that that's what God intended all along. It was humans like us that drew the lines, who draw the lines. And my gut is that, that God says today, if you want to be a part of my way, then you belong to me. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And depending on who you are, or what season of life you are in, that might hit you differently. It may sound ridiculous and wrongheaded and not fair at all. And to that, all I have to say is, this is the way of Jesus, where grace isn't fair. And thank God, because we will all need grace sometime. Depending on where, you're, where you are in life, this may sound like just idealistic mumbo jumbo. And to that, what I have to say is that the economy of God doesn't always make sense. 
but there is room for everybody. And just because somebody else is included doesn't mean that you have to be pushed out. And that may sound too good to be true, but God makes too good true. If today this hits you and it sounds like the best news you have ever heard, then what I have to say to you is just that this is just the beginning of the good news. So welcome to the upside down kingdom. We're servants that sit on thrones where the last become the first and the greatest are unknowns. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much for including us in your family, for inviting us to your table, for sitting down and for doing life with us. We're thankful that you have not left any one of us out, that every one of us belongs. And we pray now that like Philip, we would have eyes to see, goggles to see anyone out there who is on the fringes or who feels left out or like they can't possibly belong to your family for one reason or another. And we pray for the grace and the gumption to welcome them with open arms, just as you welcome all of us with open arms. We thank you for your radical inclusion and your great love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
offer our praise to you. We offer our love and our commitment to you for you have offered so much of yourself for us. God, we trust you with all that we are and all that we have. We're thankful for all of the ways you have provided for us and sustained us, that you have comforted us, comforted us in hard times and you have celebrated with us in good times. And so God, even now, We ask that you would continue to work mightily in our lives and in the life of this whole world that you so love. God, we pray that you would bring healing in the minds and in the bodies and in the spirits of those who are sick. We ask for your comfort and your peace for those who grieve. God, we ask for for peace and love and understanding in places that are torn apart by division and even violence, God, there are some places where only you can bring peace. God, we ask that where there is um, destruction and mayhem, that you would bring a wholeness back to communities and back to the land. God, we, we confess now that we need you for all of these things, that, that only you can make this world right again. And so we ask for a mighty work of your hand. And we pray it in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Your 
to be with you in worship today. My prayer is that you have been in the presence of God and that you'll remember that when you go from this place, God goes with you. Now, will you receive this blessing? Go from this place, having on those goggles, those goggles that, that see anyone who is on the fringes, who feels left out, that you might reach out a hand of grace and welcome them into the household of God, just as God has welcomed each and every one of you. Now go in peace in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey friends, thanks for joining us in worship this morning. Just a reminder that you can click on the uh, link in our video description to register your attendance, or you can just make a note in the comment section if you're watching on Facebook. We just wanna remind you also that if you want more information about things that are going on in the life of our church, to visit us on social media or check out our website at trinitybirmingham.com. We are so grateful for you, so grateful that you are part of our church family.